Everything anyone has ever told me is a lie, he said. I eased the Lorax down on my glass coffee table, along with my lighter. The bowl I just packed could wait. He stood in my front doorway, his eyes bloodshot, dilated, and staring through me at some point beyond the reaches of space-time. His short blonde hair looked sticky and was soaked with sweat. His face, unshaven, smeared black. The likes of the homeless men from the beach, not the straight-shooting undergrad, reared on the basketball courts of SoCal suburbia. You can only sell your soul to the devil, he continued. The skin on his face and neck looked loose, like he'd aged years in the three weeks I'd been hiding in the library for finals. It hung off his neck like someone had sucked the meat off his bones with a straw. What's going on, Max? I asked, more fear in my voice than I wanted to transmit. I wanted to act normal. I didn't know what happened to him. I didn't know what he was capable of. It's all a lie. They're all liars, he said, his teeth clenched. Who are liars, Max? Everyone. He lurched onto my linoleum entryway with bare feet blackened by asphalt and Santa Barbara beach tar. Baby blue basketball shorts hung from his waist, thick hairy calves sticking out underneath. A maroon t-shirt rested on his shoulders, sweat stained in the armpits and coated with sand. I'd been waiting for him, sitting on my futon in the living room with my front door open, reading Ken Casey as the sun set up the coast listening to the wind blow the fronds of the palm tree right outside my second-story balcony, the last of the red keg cups falling off the railing, seagulls squawking for scraps in the empty dumpster downstairs. I'd stuck around a few weeks after graduation, relieved most of the 20,000 students who had swarmed the streets of Isla Vista were now back home. I wanted a few days in the ghost town to myself to prepare for the transition into the real world, or to prolong it. I figured Max had a similar idea, but was out enjoying his freedom. Until his father showed up at my door yesterday and asked where his son was, having driven the family truck <coughs> up from Riverside, puzzled as to why his son, his son wasn't home on the day of the scheduled move out. I hadn't seen Max in weeks, I told him. All that study. His father didn't ask any more questions, just gave me his number to call if, no, when Max showed up. He sat in his truck out front for half an hour, then drove back to his hotel room. You can only sell your soul to the devil, Max repeated, adamant as he eased down onto one of my chairs, leaning forward once he was there, engaged elbows weighing down on his lap. He stopped looking through me. Instead, intent on a stare down with my pet corn snake, coiled in its cage in the far corner of the room. You can't trust anyone. I swallowed, where have you been, before it left my throat. My mother would have asked that. Why not, Max? I didn't know what else to say. I half figured if I kept repeating his name, the Max that I knew would reappear. He didn't. The prolonged silence made me notice Max's right leg anxiously bouncing up and down. I dog-eared page 213 of my book lying next to me and left Chief Bromden's wisdom for later. So where you been? I asked. I couldn't help it. Walking around, seeing people. Where'd you go? They lied to me. Who lied? You can only sell your soul. The sound of footsteps climbing up the stucco stairs reached Max and me at the end of the hall. I stiffened, sat up straight, kept an eye on my doorway. Jake? 
Max's father questioned me from his perch on my welcome mat. Max is in here, I said. His father lifted his eyebrows before quickly lowering them. Then a subtle head tilt I wasn't meant to see. He seemed to notice the look on my face, like it was one he'd seen before. Hey, Max, his father said nonchalantly. The eyebrows went back up, like everything was normal. I recognized the poker face. Why don't you come over next door and hang out with me for a bit? Max looked back through me again. Come on, Max, how about some TV, huh? Max shifted his weight to lean forward and stood, taller than I'd ever seen him. Father and son, father and son stared at each other. My gaze darted between them. No one said anything. Across the street, a saxophonist I'd been tuning out was finally running out of breath. Downstairs, the seagulls took five from their dumpster dive. Out on my balcony, the breeze quit toying with the fallen plastic red keg cups. Back in my room, the elephant was perfectly still. Then he flicked his tail at the fly on the wall. Max's father turned around deliberately, walked quietly out of the room. He opened Max's front door across the hall and closed it softly. I heard Max's television hum on through the adjoining wall. Max took a step towards my door, and a couple more. Everything's a lie, he said, then left my door wide open behind him. His own cracked open a few seconds later. It clicked shut. I didn't hear it lock. I was alone again, in my apartment, back where I started. The sky now cast a pink glow on the walls. Even the sun was ditching me. The lower frequencies of Max's father's voice began to reverberate around the room. I could hear Max talking too, though only short spurts at a time. I leaned forward and reached for my lighter. I grabbed the Lorax off the glass, lit up the bowl. A gust of wind shot through my room, Max's front door flying open. Then it slammed shut. Baby blue and maroon flashed past, then footsteps sprinting down the hall. Max, his father shouted after him, get back here! But Max didn't stop. His heels stomped down the stairs, shaking the walls. I ran out on my balcony and leaned out over the railing. At ground level, Max must have doubled back, headed under the apartment complex, toward the parking lot, because I saw him shoot out under me, head down, feet slapping against the concrete. I wanted to call out to him, but not to stop, not to come back. I wanted to warn him. I wanted to warn him that there wasn't a way out back there, just a dead end. A rickety wooden fence at the back of the property, closing him in. He jumped the fence before I found the courage. And that's the last image I have of him. The image that seared into my memory. The image that started that summer. The image that tossed me out into the real world. The one where Max is floating above the top of the fence, knees tucked in tight to his torso, his bulging right arm burying his body weight, his head slightly turned. His profile with an eye on his peripheral, like he's looking back at what he's running from. Straddling the line between here and there. The line between so many things. The top of that creaking fence that lingers in the present. <laughs>